The room's getting quiet. I guess that means it's time to start. Welcome to the convenience store convention. Uh, we <laughs> now, we are at the Franchise Springboard doing a quick little video selfie. Uh, the room is filling up. We got our illustrious panel of experts, and we're going to be talking about how to identify the ideal franchisee, that ideal avatar or profile. And say hi to the world. We're going to post this on LinkedIn like we always do. That's your franchise family, and this is franchising. We give, we share, we help, we support, and we're always getting better and changing lives through franchising. I'm your host, Fred Boswell, moderator today. We've got an exciting panelist, a panel of uh, experts, and we're going to have a lot of Q&A, and you guys, there's a lot of experts in the audience, so hope you'll chime in too and help us all grow together. You know, nothing happens until something is sold. You've heard that so many times. Well, in franchising, nothing really substantial happens. Money doesn't exchange hands, lives aren't changed, communities aren't impacted until a franchise is awarded. So we're gonna talk about how to award that ideal franchisee, your concept. How about we start getting to know each other a little bit with Marcy. Thanks, Red. Hi, everyone. Marcy Kleinsasser. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Franchise Development at Home Franchise Concepts. We are a multi-brand franchisor in the home services space. We have 10 brands. Our largest brand and our legacy brand is Budget Blinds. And probably our smallest brand is Aussie Pet Mobile in the pet mobile grooming space. And I've been in franchising most of my career. I started when I was five. Uh, and I'm really <laughs> glad to be with you today. And you guys get close to that microphone. Big room. How's that? Good. We'll see. All right. Uh, my name is Ben Crosby. I'm currently the CEO and uh, founder of The Drip Bar. Uh, we do IV infusions. We're a franchise company. We started opening up so, uh, locations in January of 21. We're currently up to 72, opening one to two a week for the foreseeable future. My previous life, I was uh, developing another franchise company called Tap Out Fitness. It was a... Uh, MMA-inspired fitness center that we grew and developed. Uh, I exited that in uh, January of 2019. Uh, so happy to be here. Thanks, Ben. Abby? Good morning, everyone. I'm Abby Fogel. I am Vice President of Marketing and Brand Relations for Unleash Brands. We are a platform company serving moms and families and their kiddos. We've got six youth enrichment brands in our platform, and we have 1,500 locations open and in development with 850 franchisees, and our mission is to build great kids. Awesome. Uh, good morning. My name is Paul Tiro. I am uh, the founder and CEO of uh, burrito brand called Bubba Coos Burritos. Uh, we're up to about 120 units, uh, probably ending the month. Uh, I've been in the business since I was nine years old. <laughs> so uh, food business since I was nine, I don't think that was obviously very legal. Uh, and uh, just really excited about our growth. Uh, I've got about another 150 units to build and uh, things are really good and excited to be here and to add value. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm Red Boswell. I'm president of a large franchise consulting or broker group, referral consultants, as well as Franchise Wire, a new source in franchising. Um, if you're a Zor in the room, it's primarily franchisors in here learning about I ideal franchisee profiling. If you've got zero units, zero franchise units, not corporate, zero franchise units, stand up. Zero. Wow, look at that. Let's give it to them, guys. Well done. Dude, that's like a third the room. I thought we'd have one or two. That's awesome. You, sh I, you should be proud of, you're doing it right, starting right. Wish I had started at an event like this with no Zs. I'd have had a lot better Z profile for sure and a lot happier, more royalties, everything. Okay, so if you got one to, one to nine, one to nine Zs, stand up. Look at that, about the same number. There's another quarter of the room. Beautiful, thank you. One to nine, awesome. And then let's say, uh, t you know, 10 to, 10 to 50. 10 to 50. Wow, we're getting about another, about 15%. Nice, okay. And uh, 50 and up. Azor with 50 and up. And wow, what a good, good spread. Beautiful. JT, you have more than 50? Thank, <laughs> thank you, guys. This is beautiful. So lots of experience. I hope you saw some of these. Zors with more than 50 units at your table. 
Get their names, get their numbers, connect on LinkedIn and stay connected and let's help each other change lives and have a lot of fun in this industry. You know, why this topic is so important is you're gonna spend less money to attract that ideal franchisee. You're gonna have more fun with that ideal franchisee because they're the right person for your brand. You're going to uh, en enjoy your work more. They're gonna enjoy their life more. They're gonna pay you more royalties. They're gonna buy your franchise faster. Everything works better when you're talking to the right individual that just is your team, your people. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how we do that today. Let's start back, uh, we'll start at the end, Marcy. We're gonna start with Paul this time. Paul, a thought or two on how you guys Bubba Coos Burritos, identify your ideal franchisee. Oh, geez. Well, um, you know, I think it's pretty quintessential, but I'll, I'll give you, you know, this, uh, the answer. You know, we look for, obviously, you know, passionate people. We look for people with experience. That's obviously the big one. And more importantly, not only experience, but preferably experience even in the franchise space. That's really ideal, okay? So not people that are just working in food service, uh, or fast casual, but people that are also working in, you know, of some type of franchise brand, which I think is huge because they understand franchising, and they're not going to be surprised by the royalty and the the marketing fees and things of that nature, and being what I would consider semi-managed. Uh, second big thing, uh, besides the experience, is the net worth. So we look for a certain net worth that that person uh, or that that group needs to have. And uh, thirdly, we look for really strong liquidity, that they actually have the cash to build their restaurant. So I'd say, you know, and, and personality, I mean, I, I, that's kind of like, you know, the, uh, the denominator, I don't know if we talk enough about, but, you know, we have something, and I'm, I'm sure you, you know, many people, all my panelists here understand this, but we do something called the Discovery Day, where all these people come in from all over, all different parts of the country, uh, they get an opportunity to go down to one of our training stores. We actually have a Bubba Coos Mercedes Sprinter bus where we put everybody on. We ship them down, and uh, we introduce them to the brand. It's a great day because it really, you know, it's a very two-sided process, not one-sided. And I'll get into more of that in a little bit, but uh, it, it really comes down to giving them an opportunity to see us in action, and it gives us an opportunity, opportunity to interact and see them in action. So, you know, it's a day where they come in, they come down, they go to the restaurant, uh, we, we call it breaking bread, but we, uh, you know, we put out a lot of food for them to sample, a lot of the funky food that we do that's really creative and, and different, you know, much different than our competition. And um, again, it's just an opportunity to kind of go through the room, talk to people. Again, the franchise partners have an opportunity, or the prospective franchise partners have an opportunity to walk to the restaurant, and feel it, see it, and then come 11 o'clock, actually customers come in the door and then they get a chance to really see what's going on. So again, it's a, it's a two-way street here. It gives the franchise, the potential franchise uh, owner an opportunity to see us and it gives us an opportunity to experience them. And you know, we powwow after the executive team and I and we, we say, hey, you know, I really liked or I enjoyed X, you know, X person and they were great and they were passionate. They, they understood the brand, they've been to stores, they've done their research. And, and I'd have to say that you know, our filter is pretty strong. Um, and again, I could speak to that in a little bit, but our filter is very strong. And I'd say we probably, we've already vetted people before they even made it there. And the people that make it there, we probably only take half. So I'd say, you know, our rate, our selection rate is probably 20% of the people that apply actually make it. 20% so. of the people that apply actually make it, and about 50% of those who make it to Discovery Day are ultimately awarded a franchise. Uh, in and around, uh, that's yeah. pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's a big number. It's very aggressive to turn down that many people it who is. are yeah. I always waving say, a check. Yeah, I always say I think we could be double the size if we weren't so, so picky. But it really, it pays off in spades later. And you'd be half yeah. as happy, too. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Abby, you've got how many brands? Currently have six. Six brands, big brands, big budgets. <laughs> You're able to really identify that avatar. Another word you'll hear often, avatar, ideal candidate profile or avatar. And ideally, you want to do it before you spend a dollar. You want to do it before they've 
gotten into process, gotten to discovery day. You know, that's, that's one time you can vet them out. But how about vet them out before you ever, they ever see your message in the first place? So how do y'all do that? Yeah, it's a great question. So part of our brand integration process that we have at Unleashed Brands is mapping out the ideal candidate profile, the exact name of this session. And so in my role of Vice President of Marketing overseeing our franchise development efforts, I meet with the founders and the management teams and the teams behind the brands that we have acquired to really understand their franchise system. And so the backgrounds of their franchisees, what are they passionate about? What are their strengths? And so my number one advice for those in the room who are looking at mapping this out is ask Ask questions. What is the background of our franchisees? What are they good at? Are they good at sales? Are they good at marketing? Is that because they came from sales and marketing background? Or maybe you need someone that's process driven. And so really asking those questions of your team and your franchisees, those that come into Discovery Day, as Paul mentioned, um, figuring out what their backgrounds are and what their strengths are, and also their key motivators. Are they looking for an income replacement? Are they looking to build a family business for themselves, maybe a legacy that they can pass down. And then again, building that avatar. Um, is it someone that does have that sales and marketing background? Are they motivated by income replacement or are they looking for maybe a more of an investment opportunity into, and also to not to overcomplicate things for this room, but you may have more than one avatar. So you may have a single unit avatar. You may have a multi-unit avatar. Maybe you even have an investor avatar. And so those different types of avatars are motivated by different things. Your single unit owner is mostly going to be looking for maybe an income replacement. They could grow into a multi-unit owner. Someone at that investment um, level kind of owner is looking for you know that wealth building opportunity. And so you may have more than one avatar. So definitely start with one, knowing that you may have more, but ask those questions of your candidates that are coming in and your franchisees and thinking about aspirationally where you want the business to be. So the candidates and the franchisees that you have today may not be your avatar of tomorrow or who will sustain your franchise going forward. So you may be getting one type of person in this profession now, but really for that long-term growth or for that multi-unit owner, you might need to attract a different type of candidate and so be willing to adjust. But asking those questions, figuring out those people, what they're motivated by and what their strengths are, um, are really helpful. And there's a lot of you in the room that don't have one unit yet, so I know you can't ask your franchisee, so you're like, who do I ask? So really look at your business model and what that franchise owner will be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're a mobile concept, a lot of the day-to-day -day may be grassroots marketing. So you need someone who's outgoing, um, who might have a sales and marketing background, um, and looking at those daily operations if you don't have franchisees to pull from already, because I know we've got a mixed number of units in the group here, um, but thinking about the daily operations of your business and who might be the best person to fulfill that role. And once you've identified who that avatar is, then again, you've spent none to little money, a little bit of time, yep. then you are going to w find out where they hang out. And that's where you're targeting. Instead of that pay and spray, just shotgun approach to anything and everything, trying to get noticed, now you're able to laser focus it. I still remember three years ago, I'd interview franchisors daily. I look at their profiles of their ideal candidates daily, hourly, and many times. And I saw a franchisor, most franchisors, when we ask them, who's your ideal candidate? because our consultants are asking them every day and they're looking at their profile. We hear platitude after platitude. We need someone who's a self-starter, uh, who can follow a proven system for success and is good at managing people, maybe connected in the community. And now we're already asleep. Who doesn't want those people? Every Zor in America says that, can build a team. Wow. Yeah, Red, I would piggyback on that and say, put pen to paper. So this avatar cannot live in the mind of one of your recruiters. I actually map it out on a PDF, which makes it easy to reference. Um, so making sure that once you have identified this avatar, take a cute little stock photo, put it next to him. I've got multi-unit Matt and I've got single unit Sally and dozens of other profiles, but actually putting pen to paper, paper and mapping that down so it's not just living in someone's mind and it gives you that really good target point and reminder of who you are trying to attract on a daily basis. A good point. And as we uh, about to hear from Ben, that last part on that ideal profile, I still remember three years ago, a franchisor in their ideal candidate profile said, 
If your candidate has ever been in pharmaceutical cells, please show them a modest senior care. I still remember it. That was so laser focused. They had some Z's that from, from, from that background did real well. They started focusing, got a few more, did real well. And they're like, man, that's our profile. They took it to the level of, okay, now we know who we're going after. We're going to go after them to the consultant or broker community. But they also went online and they took a picture of a Z with that background and literally said, life after Pfizer. And they're, 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 they're laser focused and pay per click on the Pfizer profile, the Pfizer reps, and there's a bunch of them out there. And supposedly at the time, anyway, they weren't very happy. And then learn on the bottom, learn how an ex Pfizer sales rep discovered their dream career in franchising. Click here. Oh my gosh. Who's in Pfizer that is a salesperson that wouldn't click on that just to find out what in the world that is all about? So, laser focused avatar. Ben. Okay, so uh, I would identify personas more in phases, like we, we took the, uh, the roll call earlier. There's a different persona clientele or franchisee when you have zero, zero to 10, one to 10, 10 plus. Uh, I've had the honor of bringing on, uh, you know, the first in, in two brands all the way through 10. And, you know, I've found that the persona early on is more of an entrepreneurial uh, persona, but in franchising, the common thread is having a strong DNA for the business, having a, the correct corporate culture, but you're gonna have people that are more on the entrepreneurial, higher risk takers that are early on that are gonna really want to uh, align with you as a partner. Nice. So, like a different avatar choices. early on as you're an emerging brand might be a little bit different as they are more risk tolerant yep. and more of an entrepreneurial uh, bent to them because they will take that risk and start earlier with you. And then as you grow and mature, that avatar matures with the brand. Definitely. That's a good point. Definitely. Uh, Marcy, with those red glasses. <laughs> uh, I don't have too many things to add. I would almost say start to think about things that you don't want in your initial mm -hmm. yeah. candidates. So not to pile on what you do want to look for, but what don't you want? What would you rule out? What would you not want in your brand? So as an example, if you have a passion brand or a brand that, for instance, I'll use our Aussie Petmobile brand, we, we definitely want our owners to have a passion for pets, but they don't have to have a love for pets. It's not a requirement that they have a pet even, but we don't want them to hate pets. Obviously their team needs to have a desire to want to work for pets, but it's not a requirement that they have a love for pets. But use that as an example. What would you rule out? What are some of the things that are non-negotiable that, that you would want to eliminate from your avatar? So that's what I would add. Because all and you learn the about illustrious panelists already gave you such great tips to what to include. It's a great ba background diversity here it is incredible with the, the time in the industry and the different uh, sectors they've been in. So if you in the audience have a clearly defined written avatar, I'm not going to ask you to share it, but if you raise your hand high, if you literally have that already done for any of your brands, anyone, one, two, awesome. three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven out of uh, 107. Uh, beautiful. You're in the right place. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you have something to share and you can talk real loud. We will gladly uh, accept some advice from you. So one way to identify this is through profiling tools, the technologies out there. We've all heard of DISC, D-I-S-C, and the DISC assessments and identifying what DISC profile is uh, most appropriate. Uh, Myers-Briggs certainly is an appropriate one. The industry has really embraced Zoracle, Zoracle with a K, it's a franchise Zor, Zor, and then Oracle, but they had to change the C to a K because Oracle went after them. So Zoracle is a tool that I think is fantastic. And these various tools, String Finders 2.0, find your tool and go deep with it can make a, a real impact on finding that ideal franchise candidate. So for instance, if you have 20 Zs, most people in here might have 20, and you had all 20 Z's take whatever that profile is, Zoracle, and you get all the feedback, and you already know who your top 10 are, top 10%, top 20%, bottom 20%, and you start looking at all the profiles, lay them on top of each other, you're gonna see some trends, some very clear trends, 
And guess what you do with those trends? The knowledge you have now of who the top performers are and what their profile is, bottom performers, what their profile is. Now, each candidate that goes through your process at the appropriate time in the process, and I'm going to ask the panelists if you do this and when you do it, you can have your candidates and should have your candidates take that profile. Now you've got the answers to, do we want them? Do they fit? And it can be an extremely good sales tool for you for the right candidate. OMG, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you are a perfect match for our top 20% franchisees that are doing X, Y, and Z in the item 19 and making this money. We gotta talk, let's talk further. Or maybe um, you know, part as friends and try not to get cussed out when you turn them down because they are a profile you are not interested in pursuing. Make your life a whole lot easier. Marcy, um, do you incorporate any of those technologies and tools into uh, your process? Yeah, so over the years I've used pretty much every profile you just mentioned. Um, at Home Franchise Concepts, we're actually rolling in now the predictive index. So our parent company, JM Family, um, uses predictive index through all of their companies. And so we are now having our top performers through all of our brands take predictive index. We just completed this with our Taylor Closet, the Taylor Closet and Premier Garage brands. And we are using this um, really to our advantage to really find out what behaviors our top performing franchisees possess and how we can use that profile to, again, as you mentioned, coach the candidates that are coming through um, in our engaging um, phase of our process and really advise them exactly as you mentioned that they would be a perfect fit and here's how we can match that fit to the right brand. Typically they come through um, advising um, the candidate that they're the best fit for the brand that they're interested in, but sometimes we will pivot them to a better brand, a better brand for their interests and their fit based on that profile. So again, we look at the behaviors um, that come through in the predictive index and we'll say based on the ideal candidate for that particular brand, that fit um, would fit their desires, um, where we think that they will excel and thrive as a business owner for that particular brand. Nice. And knowing that information that you get back from Predictive Index or any of the tools, it also gives you the ammunition to be able to talk to them on their level. Use the words that matter to them. Speak to their business love language. And again, make a deal that might not have happened had you not had that insider psycho psycho psychographic information about this candidate. Ben, get close to that microphone and give us some, uh, drop some nuggets of wisdom, bro. I'm not gonna have many on this one. <laughs> we, we don't use anything as our standard method. Uh, we get them all from various consultants and other networks when, the, when those leads are coming in. Uh, we go a little old school. Uh, I introduce them to a lot of other franchisees, successful franchisees, and I allow other franchisees to have input on bringing them in because I want to align that culture. And a lot of times in my experience or just my feeling, like a lot of the tests don't always align to, to the feelings and the, the interpersonal relationships that are created during the discovery process. Nice. I, ju I just want to. I want to add to that. Yeah, ben n nailed it because I think Ben's really speaking to a lot of people that again have no franchises or have very few, and you know um, I think that's that's right on. You know, it's like sometimes you do you 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 reach into your gut and you make that decision. You know, there's two just two things I want to add because I know how quickly this goes and I think it's really important. Um, is number one, if you have a concept and you want to franchise and you're really passionate about franchising, you know, I always say, and I'm, no, I'm sorry for going off topic, <laughs> but uh, is, you know, if you have one or two units, grow your, grow your base, okay? That's huge, okay? So it, we're kind of a reverse uh, methodology here, but you will attract great candidates if you have a good sample or a good size um, you know, company. When I mean it's a good size, if you have one or two units, you're like really excited about it, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna franchise this, bad move, in my opinion. It's just bad move. I would grow it to like eight, nine, 10. Because what, what, what these guys or these sophisticated ladies are gonna do is they're gonna come to you and they're gonna say, let's see your financials. If you have one unit or two units and you're like, here's our, here's our outstanding you know, P&Ls, they're gonna be like, um, that's cool, but it's only two units, maybe you just got lucky. So they're gonna to wanna to see a good sample. 
That's number one, okay? I mean, big. Like, that's probably some of the best advice that you're going to get out of me, at least, is, is to definitely have a good sample of units for people to look at. They want to see all your P&Ls on the table. Number two, and uh, John Tezza, I don't know if he's here today or not, um, but I haven't seen him. But John Tezza usually attends these conferences. He lived, or I, I live in Naples, Florida now. I lived in Point Pleasant, New Jersey for the better, better part of 20 years. But John and I were very close. And when I was first franchising, one of the things I had a really hard time with, this is going off the bend, is I was, I was holding it tight. I, I wouldn't franchise it to just anybody. It was like my baby, you know? I wouldn't let it go. And John Tezzi came to me and said, listen, man, you've been trying to find somebody for six months. You have nobody? I said, no. I got people interested, but I have nobody. He goes, let it go. He just said, let it go. You know, and I was just like, it took a little while to sink in, but we had to franchise to somebody to get the ball rolling. And I did that, and that was probably the best move I made. Wasn't the greatest franchisee. You're not going to get the, the best franchisees as your first, second, and third franchisees, by the way. But, um, you know, you need to get the ball rolling somehow, and that's going to be making decisions on the what I call, unfortunately, the best of the worst. And then you go from there. But I, I think, again, if you could start with that good sample and that good core, that's, that's probably one of the best decisions you'll make. So do we have that... Um Frozen theme song cued. Let it go. Let, okay. Um, pretty, pretty much. That's rare. That's the opposite of just about anybody else. Most Zors, especially brand new emerging, they got money, they buy it. I mean, I'll take it, right? They, we need it. And I had a, a, a my pulse sales guy. Test. Huh? Is it the pulse test? The pulse test. Yeah. Exactly. The Fogamira <laughs> test. I think so we that's all what, could tell a story about one of those. We can. <laughs> yeah. I, and um, it's so hard to turn that money down when you need it. But boy, talk about a one-time decision that it's a, it's a bad marriage. It's a miserable life. And uh, so you want to get that ideal candidate. A Abby, you've got a bunch of brands and been doing it. How are you identifying them? Yeah, so on along the similar lines as this group has said, we do use the DISC profile um, during our candidate process. In addition to that, we really look at th those that have signed franchise agreements what their profiles are. And so our recruiters on a monthly basis, after the month has closed and during the month, they submit um, a form with all of their deal de details. And I make them fill out a little paragraph about the background of the candidate that I not only mine for PR opportunities, but also to see where our deals are coming from and what those people look like. So again, the, uh, that professional background that they may have, what are they looking for? Are they a customer of ours that fell in love with the brand and now they're looking for it in a different territory? So collecting that information from those that are selling your franchises is very important as well. We have discovery days and when they come in for discovery day, we also make them fill out a candidate um, you know, packet that we can learn more about them and our executive team knows who they are when they step in our doors of our headquarters. And so there's some important information in that packet as well that helps me understand the background of these individuals and their motivators and so again we use the disc profile which is very helpful but also understanding those who have recently signed franchise agreements with you and looking at the details of those individuals and we heard earlier a pet brand and you know you would ask them if they say they love pets or that was a great thing uh, 25 years ago I founded a, a, a pet franchise a pet business franchised it about 20 years ago and we were the opposite and you would not think that so when we would be talking to a candidate if they said you know, we ask them what their motivations are why, what's their why kind of getting down to that and if they said I really love pets that was a big red flag for us and yet pet was in the title of the company we had to communicate very strongly that you're not going to be working with the pet you rarely see the pet we clean up after the pets in the yard. You need to be loving some money. You know, you need to be hungry and, and, and follow and get out there and be a marketer and put our plan in place. So different mindset and you really got to understand that or you're going to, again, attract the wrong folks real fast. Go ahead. Well, Marsh. if I can just jump in when we were we were going through onboarding a new PR firm and we brought in all the brand presidents to kind of have, have an onboarding process with our PR firm, and we were asking the, pre the brand presidents at the time, tell us a little about, about who 
who is in your brand, your existing franchisees, and who do you want to onboard? And some of the brand presidents were talking about kind of the lifestyle, kind of soft skills that they were looking for. And that's where these conversations were happening, whether, you know, we want them to like design with, with our, the Taylor Closet and or Premier Garage or some, some of those brands in our portfolio. And, and we kind of pushed back and said, well, is that, is that a nice to have? Is that a necess necessity in terms of their wants and needs? And so it kind of lives along the lines of when our candidates do come through the process and then they do sign with us, we keep the same types of information that Abby was talking talking about. And I would encourage all of you, at, certainly as you're bu building out an, an emerging brand or even starting from scratch, you haven't even sold your first franchise, what exactly are you looking for for this person to do in their, like the day in the life of your franchise owner. What skills are you looking for them to execute on versus what's their passions or, or their li lifestyle types of things that you want them to come to you with? Because sometimes they're, they're very different because you do want them to follow a system, you want them to follow a model, but where can they kind of diverge from that and where do you want them to complement that in their prior lives? So I think that's really important when you're creating your avatars. And again, it could be multiple avatars as you evolve. Part of the way you uh, communicate that ideal candidate is by communicating your culture and all that you do, all over the website, in your webinars, in your one-on-one -on -one calls, the rest of the team calls, the discovery days. I, you know, when I was Azor, we uh, put, we, we thought we were doing a decent job. We had a, a, a fairly conservative Christian culture to the group. To, the, to, to my franchise organization. We had the organizations we support on our website. We, uh, you know, we thought we talked about that, and yet, at our convention, a year after a franchisee had come on board, he was very Jewish. We love us some Jewish our, uh, friends, but when, I, when we said a prayer to Jesus, he was quite offended. Had a big old talk to me later. And I was embarrassed and shocked that how in the world did this fella get through our entire process, be a franchisee for a year, didn't even know what we stood for as an organization. My bad completely. So f part of finding that ideal candidate is letting them scare themselves away or weed themselves out because they feel like they don't fit. Office Pride is a unique example. They call themselves, I love this tagline. Again, a tagline I've, I've mem remembered for years. And it's not even official tagline. It's just something they use to describe themselves. We're the... Chick-fil-A of commercial cleaning. Dude, tells what the, you know what they stand for right there. So do you have a, a, a tagline or some s simple phrase that you can share with your candidates that will make them embrace you or make them go, yeah, I'm not into chicken, bro, come on, you know, and move on. So little things like that can make a big difference. Abby, other thoughts on uh, the avatar and the ideal candidate? Yeah, I would say um, as far as that tracking where your leads are coming from, we, we touched a little bit about where we're going to find them. And a lot of this conversation has been around just mapping it out before you even spend that $1. And so I would say after you get into spending those dollars, really tracking where your leads are coming from and where those who fit your ideal candidate profile are coming from as well. And so I'm always shocked by the amount of people who aren't tracking their lead sources, aren't tracking the efficiency of their lead sources. And I think consumer marketing takes on a lot of the pressure when it comes to data. And franchise development is equally as important when it comes to tracking your lead, lead sources, cost per lead, cost per deal, and all of those good numbers that you're targeting. And so making sure that you're also looking at, OK, I had this person who came in who just signed an FA, very excited about them. They fit our, our ideal candidate profile. Now, where did they come from? Do you know? Um, and figuring that out and going back to that source and using that as an efficient source for you. So I would say once you're in that realm of spending those dollars because you've got your ideal candidate profile mapped out, being sure that you are tracking your lead sources and tracking where those ideal candidate profiles are coming from so you can continue to spend efficiently and attract more of those ideal candidate profiles is, is very important. So uh, Ben, when you've, uh, you've done a lot of friend dev and you've had friend dev guys on your team, yep. a big part of who you bring in is that friend dev person. Do they fit, relatively speaking, with that avatar? How do you, how do you uh, address yeah, that? Definitely. Uh, bringing people onto the team, you need to make sure, at least in, in my experience, need to make sure that they fit the corporate DNA, that they want to uh, continue to grow and, and build within the organization. But also, I try to teach my team that 
bringing on a new franchisee isn't a sales process. It's developing a relationship and a rapport. Like we're we're not a huge company that has all these data and all this these metrics and all these tools and and whatnot. And a lot of you emerging concepts out there are are probably very very similar. You know, so you don't want the candidates to feel like they're being oversold. You want to be able to welcome them in sort of as a partner, realizing that whoever you join with, whoever joins your franchise system, whoever signs CFA, they're going to be your franchisee and your partner for the next 10 plus years. You know, good, bad, indifferent, you know, you, you, you're working with them. Yeah. And uh, I think like Shannon the Cannon said it, Having the culture where after every franchisee joins, having that reach out, that uh, touch point from the team welcoming them in, either they get a big box of title boxing equipment or the CEO calls them. With us, I do all of our, uh, I do, I try to do the majority of our initial calls to weed them out sooner than later um, to make the process that much more efficient. But once they join, I have my site development team call and we do a whole text and an email to the entire team introducing them as a new franchisee. And I make it a requirement that uh, every member on my team replies to the text or to the email without, with something that isn't canned, not a cut and paste like, oh, welcome to the team, yay. You know, it has to be original and unique. Uh, each time, and, and that's done a lot. Human. Marcy, I'm going to ask you about marketing to that ideal avatar in a sec. Have you heard of the, we all know the golden rule, right? Well, there's another phrase, the greatest management principle in the world. That which gets rewarded gets done. That which gets rewarded gets done. And I'll extend it, that which gets punished stops happening. And so take that into the Fran Dev world. If we're paying our franchise development team a commission, and that's it. Or, you know, they got a salary, whatever, but that their primary focus is commission. Where does the avatar and ideal candidate profile fall into that? How do you incentivize your frontline salespeople, let's be real, salespeople, franchise development team, to find the avatar and, more importantly, turn away the wrong candidates? How in the world do you do that? So be thinking about that, guys, and I'm going to ask Marcy about marketing to that ideal candidate, and then we're going to hit you guys with that tough question I just asked you about. Marketing to the ideal avatar, ways to do that, um, even sources, perhaps. Well, I mean, once, once you identify the candidate, your, your avatar, it, it's, it's, it, it becomes actually even simpler to then create your integrated marketing plan because you know who you're going after. So whether you know, digitally you are able to target more, more effectively on your digital channels, whether it's Google, Facebook, you are able to take those psych psychographic uh, elements of your avatar and, and be able to use the data um, that you get back as, um, as Abby was mentioning. So, we take our avatar and our ideal candidate and we use those elements that we're looking for in that profile and we then just start targeting our pay-per-click ads, our social ads, um, and even um, all of our content on our websites, we're, we're speaking directly to that candidate, all of our content. And then we can measure that in our Google Analytics to see are they tracking to those pages and adjust accordingly. So it becomes easier as you evolve your ideal candidate profiles to create content. Whether your content is developed around your founder story as you're launching, or you're evolving it to talk more about your brands as you as you grow. How about utilizing video testimonials from that ideal Z? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Again, all of your content should speak to the person that you're trying to attract. So the whole what's in it for me, you're targeting all of your content. So your video content, your print content, all of your content. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, le we lean very heavily into video on all of our channels, but everything that we use is measured and then we report back to is it working, is it not working. And I'll also speak to uh, on our sales team, uh, if they know the candidate that we're looking for, they're gonna be more successful. Mm -hmm. 
I'll piggyback so, on that yeah, as please. well. I won't, I won't have the marketing ladies take over this session because we could talk about that all day. But for those of you that are emerging brands out there, some of the marketing you're going to do in the beginning is going to be a brand awareness play. And so you may not see some perfectly linear deals that you can associate to some of these tactics, but getting your franchise name out there and creating that brand awareness because you may not have the consumer base that knows about your franchisees, that knows about your franchise system from the gates. And so things like portals and different things like that that people are searching for to find your franchise opportunity. Some of those things for emerging brands can be very helpful just from a brand awareness standpoint. Obviously, in the long term, you do want to see some deals coming from those sources, but as an emerging brand that's really getting out there and establishing yourself as a franchise opportunity, there are going to be things that are more of a long-term play and not that short-term play that you're going to see a deal signed in 45 days from starting that marketing initiative, but really the long long-term success of having that brand, awa brand awareness built for your emerging brand. Paul, you've got a brick and mortar, folks walking in and out all day long, loving the product, getting into it. There's nothing cheaper, really, than a client wanting to <coughs> buy a franchise, a customer that already knows you, and they've got some of that avatar because they already know you and like you and dig you and are getting into the culture. So you've gotten past a lot of that, and you're putting... Franchise is available on the, the door and on the cup and on the napkin and anywhere you can. So that's helping you find your ideal one. Any other insights there? Yeah, well, no, that you're, you, uh, great, uh, great intro to exactly how we pick up franchises. Extremely unorthodox. Uh, I don't know too many franchises that have grown to our size. Again, we're small in the, big, in the realm of... How many? 120. So small in the big scheme of things. How many of you would like to be small? <laughs> well, I wish I was that small. Well, you know what I mean. I, I mean, so uh, we've never really spent any money on marketing. We've never spent a dollar at any broker. Everyone hates you. <laughs> I know. I, that's why I said it's a little unorthodox. We don't spend a dollar on any broker. We don't spend any money on marketing. It's all done through word of mouth. And the, the way you can drive word of mouth is a few ways. You know, A, try to operate the best business you can operate. But B, the most important thing in the entire world is having amazing relationships with your franchisees. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say probably 75% of the, my new franchisees come from referrals from my current franchisees. And I like to like them call them franchisees. They're really franchise partners. But um, th that's exactly how we've done it. When I tell people that, they're like, you've got to be kidding me. I say, no, not at all. So, you know, is while you're, while you're franchise partners, we, we, you know, sometimes we've been actually uh, touted as over supporting our franchise partners, <laughs> but we have great relationships. They can call me at midnight to pick up the phone. And there's a lot of them. And, uh, you know, I'm present. I fly every week. I don't need to. I've got a whole executive team. We're very well insulated. I fly every week. I got nine and 11 year old girls. I fly every week to shake hands and to make sure that things are right in all these stores. Because I feel like as an owner, it's my responsibility. I could easily kick back and just go out on my boat, drive my fun, fancy cars. But, you know, when it really comes down to it, it's relationship. When they love you, they'll do anything for you, anything. And they will tell all their friends about you. And, the, and those friends will come and they'll knock on your door and you'll, you'll, you'll build your franchise base that way. I will just jump in. I've worked for a lot of different franchise systems and I will say that Paul's spot on. I will say as early as you can, as you're launching your, your emerging brands, build in a referral program for those franchisees that you're creating relationships with. I will say Home Franchise Concepts has the most amazing referral program, official appro referral program that JT Thiessen, our chief development officer who's here, has, has built and created. And I, I've never seen a program like this in all of franchising. Uh, but so as early as you can, create that referral program and incentive. It happens to be our number one lead generator and closer for our, all of our brands. And our what, What's so special about it? Uh, well, first of all, our franchisees love, love the program in that we do give them a, a cash incentive. It happens to be $15,000 if they refer. One, five, $15,000 if they refer a franchise owner who closes. And we also send them on an all expense paid um, trip every year. And they all want to go on this fantastic 
trip that JT hosts and, and um, brings them on. So to go on that trip, they have to have referred a successful buyer. Correct. And they get fifteen thousand. And they get fifteen thousand dollars. I've got a couple friends I need to. <laughs> so again, not every not every emerging franchise can can create that program, but but just create a program that says if you know, like, and trust us, and want to bring other franchisees to help grow this brand together, we're in it together. We're partners. We want you to refer others, and it, it could just be I want to take you out to a fantastic steak dinner. I'm coming, coming to take you out. Thank you for the referral. Or it can be a more formal program. I'm just saying I've worked for brands that didn't have any program. And yep. they're... They, I, I was going to say that, by the way. I was going to say what they get out of us as a, as a steak dinner. So. But that's okay. No but vacation, you're building partnerships and you want dinner. referrals. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying if you haven't thought about that, make sure that you introduce that sooner than later. Nice. Love that. Ben, any additional thoughts that, uh, there on, on incentivizing the franchise development team around your avatar? And by the way, when you get a referral from a current franchisee, there's nobody in your network that knows your ideal candidate profile better than your franchisee because they want to bring on people that's just like them. Mm -hmm. And the people that are referring them are typically the top performers. And so it, 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 it further deepens your I ideal avatar. I, I just, want, just want to add to it, and uh, it, again, is take care of your people. And I'm telling you, it's going to pay off in spades. You Questions? Know, it's going to, you know, but so Definitely. to make it even sweeter, not only do we have 120 stores, we have another 150 in the pipeline. Again, all organic. So, you know, you can do it, guys. Sure. You can do it. All right, I saw a question come up, and rather than yell it and repeat it, let's go. Can you tell me on your incentive travel that you do, do you have them so that they just here's a trip, or do you have all the people that refer travel together? Um, yes, the latter. It's an all-expense uh, four-day, four-night, five-day trip. Everyone joins together. It is everyone um, learn, learning and sharing and, and traveling to that trip together. Yes. Any advice? Certainly questions from the crowd, but advice. Experience on what not to do or what to do. We usually learn the most from what not to do. So if you got some mistakes you've made, I'd love to hear them, Stephen. I know you got, you know, we learn best from other people's mistakes. So let's get some other people's mistakes or successes or questions. Because there is no beer waiting for you after this. So you can, we can stay in here a few more minutes. JT, bring it. is that uh, we had somebody that failed the personality test for a competitive franchisor that they were most interested in and as a result they said no to him and he came over to us and it was a very similar business and today he's one of the most successful franchisees we have in our system. And so while all this is really, really good information, it's not like the only way. I would say use your intuition and ask more questions and use it as a guiding reference to say, hey, you, you didn't score well on the sales and marketing side, and this is a sales and marketing business. How are you going to overcome that? Let's talk about that. But don't use it as a, a pass or fail kind of thing, in my opinion, because that other franchisor lost out on a great guy that we gladly took, um, even though he failed their test. So, Agreed. Nice. Yeah, a takeaway sell also works real well. You say no, boy, they want it more than ever. I had a gentleman that wanted to be a consultant with us, and... Guy just talked my head off. Very annoying. You know, advisors are supposed to listen, ask questions, not tell me how awesome you are for an hour. So I, I politely turned him down after two or three conversations, and I was expecting him to cuss me out, which would further validate that I made the right decision. He took it very maturely. I'm like, okay. Called me back about a week later. Would you reconsider? I'm like, wow, again, mature. I'm, I'm a little more impressed with this annoying guy. And ultimately, I shared with him why I told him no, and I set parameters in place that you had to, he had to jump through a few more hoops. And to the rest of the story is he's one of our top consultants, million-dollar income earner. Go figure. Still talks too much, but he, he does well. So some candidates like that. Um, who else are we... Who else has a great story like JT? It doesn't have to be as good as JT's. We know that was a really good one. Right, hey, I have another quick story. I have ahead. a question actually for everyone in the audience. Who would say their avatar or their criteria says their ideal candidate needs to have a sales background? Sales background. Has to have, 
like to have. Everybody raises their so hand like that. I, I recently heard a story, and I also have this story in a prior, prior lifetime, <clears throat> that part of the, the background, <clears throat> excuse me, was they really wanted to have the candidate to have a, a sales background um, as part of the pro profile in, in that franchise um, system really said, you know, we want, want to have someone that has sales in their background. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and someone came in and they were like, this person didn't really have sales background. They really had more of a fear to be the, the face of, uh, of their brand, to have sales in their background. And, but the, the sales recruiter said, you know, if, if you feel uncomfortable with sales, they really had checked all of these other boxes. Long story short, they ended up being the rookie of the year that year for that brand, and they went on the next year to be franchisee of the year. So again, just using your intuition, are they coachable? Do they meet all of the other, you know, check all of the other boxes? Because this person did not feel comfortable in sales, but had they gone through just these are all the boxes, they have to have sales background, they wouldn't have been invited into that brand. So. Be flexible. We heard JT was flexible on that one and got a great Z out of it as well. Final thoughts, guys, as we were wrapping up here, any final thoughts or advice on finding that ideal franchisee? Finding the right franchisee is important, but also making sure that they are willing to hire. If they can also recognize their weaknesses like sales and they want to hire somebody to complement that person with sales, that can be a very strong franchise candidate as well. Yeah. Don't take the approach. You know, when you're dating someone, you're like, uh, I'll, uh, I'll fix them. Yeah. <laughs> All the married people laugh. Um, so you know you're not going to fix somebody. You're not going to change them. So find the right person from day one. And uh, why, why are you laughing so hard, <laughs> Marcy? The third marriage worked. No, just kidding. <laughs> joking. 30 years, I'm joking here. Final oh, advice. Yeah, right, yeah. I would say after you are finished mapping it out, which we've talked a lot about today, is your ideal candidate profile should not be a secret. So you do need to share it amongst your team. And so those of you that are out there thinking about mapping this person, creating that avatar, are now thinking of like, who needs to know about this avatar? And so obviously ensuring that your recruitment team understands this avatar, as Red has mentioned, who they should be speaking with, what they should be looking for. Your leadership team should also be very aligned with who your ideal candidate profile is as well. Um, they often have some decision-making power as far as who gets approved and who does not get approved or awarded, making sure that your vendors, so if you're using vendors for marketing, for franchise development, again, this is not a secret. You want them to know who you need to attract to meet your goals. And so sharing that with your vendors, again, sharing it with your franchisees, especially if you have a referral program, we do as well. Um, we have got a people like you program and ensuring that they know who we are looking for as well. So don't keep this your, your best secret. You do want your team to be very much aligned on the ideal Canada profile, whether or not they're actively selling franchisees or they're supporting franchisees because also your team at your home office can be a great source of referrals as well. So they need to know who you're looking for too. So I would say once you have that avatar down on paper, make sure that you share it with the appropriate team members so everyone is aligned top from bottom, who you're looking for and who does make that great franchisee for your system. You put that on your, <clears throat> you put that on your website too? Yes. Mm, public. You can go check out our websites to see who we're trying to attract. It might be you. <laughs> and if it is you, reach out to us. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't smell any burritos, but it's uh, about lunchtime, yeah, Paul. No. Well, real quick, I, yeah, I just wanted to open the floor because we have seconds left. Uh, we've been talking at you the whole time, and I think sometimes that's annoying. But um, any, any questions I can answer for anybody? I opened the floor 10 there, minutes a, ago. I know, oh, now she lady, raises her hand. The lady in the, lady in, in the back, yeah. Yeah, the, the very first thing we did was we took to Facebook. That's the truth. You know, we just put 
created some generic ad and put it on Facebook, started talking a lot about it, started putting, I think Red made mention of it, we, we put it on our soda cups, we put it on our bags, to-go bags, so we put it in our windows, our window POP now seeking great franchise partners. No, no. We, we, don't, we don't even do trade shows. I mean, we, we're, I think we did the multi-unit franchise conference in Vegas this year. We've done that several times. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Yeah. But, and that's a very expensive show, but it, 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 it does pull in. But I mean, again, it's probably done it about three times in all of the years we've been doing it. You find but, out where your raving fans are and you tell them the great news that they can now be part of the family. Yeah. yeah, so to again, to answer your question more succinctly, again, just those basic things I mentioned, you know. And but the, the other... The, first thing to add? Yeah, sure, please. Make sure you get your FDD done first before you start <laughs> Oh, yeah, it. that goes yes. without saying, yeah. <laughs> yes. You could yeah, market I mean, it, but you can't. Yeah, details, details. Yeah, no, no, yeah well, get well, a lawyer. Yeah, you know, well stated, <laughs> yeah. And, and we used Fisher Zucker. We, I mean, Mine I'm not here time. to advertise yeah. for Lane, but... Yeah, we figured we figured we'd go to the best, and honestly, the, those guys knocked it out of the park. To this day, that document, uh, even though it was a little pricey, uh, holds. No, it, it, it's it's worth its weight in gold because a bad FDD can really screw you up. There's nothing more expensive than a cheap attorney. Exactly, and but yeah. to, you know, I think Red's given me an opportunity to give you any advice. The the best, uh, also this, another great piece of advice is very very simple. Make sure wh whoever you're bringing on board is very well capitalized, has access to cash, or has a lot of cash. Because, you know, if they open up their doors and the business isn't strong out of the gate, they're gonna look at you and be really upset. But the people, again, who have deep pockets, they're, they're gonna, they have staying power, and if it takes them a year or a year and a half to get going, mm -hmm. they'll be happier later. But always, don't, don't bring in anybody who doesn't have cash. That's a big one. Yeah, one thing I would mention as well, you said that your customers come in, they love the theme of your ice cream shop. And so I would say, if you are looking to grow organically, perfecting your customer experience is going to be key. That's how you're going to grow organically. People are going to start to come to you and ask you if you are franchising because they come into your shops and they love the experience. They love what they experience, what their kids experience, and the family as a whole. And so that's Urban Air, which is um, one of our main concepts, actually started that way where it started as a simple trampoline park, one park, then two parks, and then people started asking our CEO, Michael Browning, are you franchising? And so it was that experience that they created when they came in. And so I would say perfecting that customer experience will help you grow organically because people then will start to come to you and ask you if you have franchising opportunities because they loved your experience so much and they want to bring that to other communities. I was just going to add, as you create your raving fans, just create your story that you're ready to tell so that you'll be ready to have that support model for your first franchise. The story will then, you'll have a line like ready, as, as Abby just said, just be yep. ready to tell your story and then how you're gonna support your franchise owners. Hey Red, I think with this lady right here had a question. Um, yeah, last question, bring it on. Yeah. Where do you find, that's uh, interesting, where do you find the tools to create that avatar? Wow. Well, it could be simple. I mean, don't overcomplicate it. Literally, you can pick a stock photo and just put text on paper to create an avatar, but we're really just talking about that stick figure, right? That person that you're trying to target, but you don't need fancy tools to create this. Literally, just pick a photo of who that person is and just start to put pen to paper of their their demographic, what does their age typically look like, what is their business background, and so yes, you can certainly create a like fancy little like bitmoji kind of avatar, mm -hmm. but truly you could literally just pick a stock photo and just start putting pen to paper to truly outline um, that individual. You yeah. could also take a photo of, a, of one of your customers yeah. and be like, okay, so this is what they look, not like literally a, cu a customer, but like take a photo and then you can mimic, okay, they look like this, this mm -hmm. is what they do for a living, this is what they like to do on the weekends, and this is the qualities of, of what yeah. they would perform. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and, and don't I'll, I'll, I'll talk offline with you on your first part of your question. Good one. 
because I think we're running. We're out going of time. back upstairs for the dinner, but we'll hang up here if you got a question you want to come up and ask us. Lunch is uh, served. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you all. Thank you.